Gargantua, pull us down closer to the horizon. Let's just hope there's still someone there to save. I'm Dr. Greg Brown, one of the astronomers at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, and I'm here to talk to you about the best and worst of sci-fi on the big and small screen. Christopher Nolan's Interstellar is awash with fascinating science, some of it great, some of it eh, a bit more out there. Matthew McConaughey and his team travel far across the universe to a supermassive black hole called Gargantua in a tiny fraction of the time it would normally take. The reason is they make use of a wormhole, a tunnel between two points in space that does away with that annoying commute between galaxies. Now, wormholes have been theorized to exist since the 1920s, and the good news is that general relativity, Albert Einstein's super successful way of trying to understand how gravity works in the universe, actually doesn't rule them out. The bad news is that we've never found one, and we don't really know how to make one of our own. Yet. While we're waiting on that, at least we can study the black holes. Black holes are extremely dense objects, incredibly heavy, billions of times the mass of the sun at their maximum, and yet they fit into incredibly small regions of space. They are inherently invisible due to how any light that gets close to them gets absorbed, but we can still observe them. One of the ways that we can do that is by using radio telescopes dotted around the Earth, combining them together into a telescope that is effectively the size of our entire planet, known as the Event Horizon Telescope, and then stare at these supermassive black holes, watching the gas being absorbed into the black hole. It may not be a wormhole, but at least we've been studying Gargantua's siblings for years and we expect to find out a lot more still. What is this thing? It's an asteroid, sir. How big are we talking? Sir, our best estimate is 97.6 billion. It's the size of Texas, Mr. President. Y yes, sir. What kind of damage are we? Damage? A total, sir. It's what we call a global killer. The end of mankind. Armageddon is infamous among scientists for being one of the most scientifically inaccurate films ever produced. Whether that's actually fair is kind of besides the point. There's a lot of mistakes in it, and there's a lot of fun to be found trying to understand where those mistakes come from. Bruce Willis, practically able to see his own house from how close the asteroid is to Earth, finally presses the button on the nuclear bomb sacrificing himself, but also splitting the asteroid into two parts that harmlessly sail either side of the Earth. Yet yeah, the problem here is power. The largest nuclear weapon that humanity has ever produced was called the Tsar Bomber, otherwise known as Big Ivan, a 100 megaton behemoth that was actually only detonated with about half that yield. Even if we put everything in the bomb's favor, it still comes woefully short of the energy needed to split the asteroid and send it hurtling off into the distance, an asteroid that is supposedly a thousand kilometers across. If Bruce Willis was going to achieve what he did, he would need a bomb at least a billion times more powerful than the largest nuclear weapon humanity has ever made. Holy crap, we've got incoming. Where the hell did they come from? Who doesn't love a big space battle? Big explosions, lasers firing, and the dodging movements of a fighter squadron. You see, often small craft in sci-fi will move similar to how planes move in the air, banking sideways in order to be able to turn. But that only works in the atmosphere. They're relying on the air underneath the wing to push them one way or the other as the wing turns. In the absence of an atmosphere, that just doesn't work. Enter Battlestar Galactica, the 2004 reimagining. They have a whole series of fighter craft known as Vipers that have propellant jets that are placed in various places across the craft. Each jet fires in order to turn the craft forwards and backwards or even flip it completely around. Now, 
they must be an absolute nightmare to pilots. We see the pilots correcting, overcorrecting, over and understeering constantly as they're fighting against this rather weird way of moving through space. <laughs> But nonetheless, it's a far more accurate way of moving through space than we see in most sci-fis. It's 1982 and the Doctor is stuck, again. This time, Peter Davidson's iteration of the Time Lord is stuck in space between an alien spacecraft and his own time-hopping ship, the TARDIS. He has no spacesuit, no way to help him move, and his time is running out. So what to do? Well, naturally, our cricket-themed Time Lord takes a cricket ball from his canonically vast pockets and throws it against the spacecraft he's just left. It bounces off the craft, comes back to him, he catches it and goes flying backwards towards his own TARDIS, arriving in the nick of time. Now, this scene gets a lot of flack, and it probably shouldn't, because the strange thing is, it would actually work, though admittedly it's not perfect. It would work both better and worse than other representations of motion in space we see in sci-fi. Worse because, granted, he'd have to throw the cricket ball a lot harder than he does in order for him to fly backwards as fast as we see, but also better because the throw itself would have launched him backwards as well. This actually is a better representation of conservation of momentum than we're used to on the small screen. <laughs> 